Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the St. Louis Zoo. I'm Louise Bradshaw. I'm the Director of Education here at the Zoo, and it's so great to see everybody here. We've got a really good crowd tonight, so I'm really happy about that. Um, first off, I know we have a lot of high school students who are here this evening. Um, you probably got some assignment or something to come here, I'm thinking. And you need to show your teacher evidence that you were here. So Peggy, who's in the back with a white shirt, will be outside at the end of the lecture, and she has a sticker for you that you can use to prove that you were here, and so you'll get a great grade from your teacher, which is really super. We're so glad to see you tonight. Um, I wanted to also uh, let you know about, let everybody know about some of the other things we have coming up here at the zoo um, in, for the rest of the month of October, um, we're having a really fun celebration on the weekends called Ottertoberfest. So it's a lot of fun we're celebrating our, our river otters, uh, music and fun and so forth. Um, we've obviously got a lot of Halloween things going on, so if you know anyone with little kids, it's really great on uh, October 22nd and October 30th, and those are St. John's Mercy Boo at the Zoo Nights. Um, on Saturday, October 23rd, we have a really neat program called Zoo Quest. Um, it's a challenging quest-based program that involves teams of people taking on a challenge, you know, and going around the zoo and seeing who knows the most and who can figure out the most. It's lots of fun and puzzles, and you don't necessarily have to be an animal expert. On Tuesday, October 26th, we'll, we'll, we will be hosting another lecture series here. Um, it's the beginning of the zoo's conservation conversations. And the first one we're having here is called Conserving the Cool. And it's about our very own Humboldt penguins. And Mike Masek, who's our curator of birds, will be giving that lecture. There's a wonderful program that we're involved with in Peru um, to really help these Humboldt penguins. They're the ones, when you go visit the Penguin Puffin Coast, the ones right outside. And uh, we've had staff down there monitoring um, their reproductive success and all sorts of different things. It's very, very fascinating and uh, community-based conservation at its best. So that's the first of our conservation conversations. Um, we have other ones through in November and the rest of the winter. And I hope you all have a science seminar series brochure. If you haven't, there's more out on the desks outside. The next one is Wednesday, November 3rd, Irrational Scientific Ideas, a Science Cafe. And that's going to be a different format for us than this typical lecture format. It's, um, we'll have a lecture by Hal Harris, who in 2010 was named the Outstanding St. Louis Science Scientist Educator from the Academy of Sciences. And uh, he will start off with sort of a provocative lecture um, and then the group gets together and has wonder wonderful discussions and dialogue. And if you've ever been to a science cafe, they're really wonderful. Another thing that's different about that is not only the format, but we'll be meeting in a different place here at the zoo. Not here in the living world, but we'll be across the zoo. So you'll need to park in the south parking lot, which is the lot over by the highway, and come in through the, the big brand new entrance. And we'll be in the river camp, which is our private facility for things like that. So uh, those are some of the things we have going on. If you have questions, hope you stop me or ask me. Um, but we are just really thrilled to be hosting this series again for, golly, how many years has it been, Rose? A long time. A long time. <laughs> it's probably 15, you know, going on 15 years. So we're really thrilled, really thrilled to be hosting it. I'd like to introduce Rose Jansen from the Academy. Well, good evening. As Louise said, we're very pleased that you were able to join us tonight. This is a long-running and very popular science seminar series that covers current and timely topics in science. Um, a lot of you are Academy members and friends, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a bit about who we are and to mention a couple additional upcoming public science seminars you might have an interest in attending. We are a local nonprofit. We've been serving the St. Louis community and surrounding counties since 1856, and we have a long-standing mission to promote and advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. 
And we do that through a number of free and low-cost public science programs, lectures, seminars, trips and tours at venues throughout the region. And you can find more information on the Academy and our community-wide events and programs by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org. You can also visit us on Facebook or Twitter or pick up some of our literature just outside the auditorium on your way out. And if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there will be some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience this evening. Um, I want to mention also a couple upcoming Academy public partnership events that you might have an interest in attending. Next Tuesday evening, October 12, 6 p.m. at the Sheldon Concert Hall, for those of you who have an interest in science and art. Washington University Associate Professor of Psychology, Dr. Brian Carpenter, speaks on the science and art of later life creativity, and that's in conjunction with Maturity and its Muse, which is an invitational showing in Sheldon Gallery's exhibition of the work of 36 professional artists who are all over the age of 70. So from 7 to 8 p.m. that same evening, following Dr. Carpenter's talk, you're invited to browse the galleries and view the artist's work. And that event is free and open to the public, and there's no need to RSVP, you just show up. That uh, same week on Friday, October the 15th, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., in partnership with OASIS at the Dennis and Judith Jones Visitors Center here in Forest Park, Dr. Sherry Dunn-Norman, who is head of program and associate professor of petroleum engineering at Missouri, University of Science and Technology speaks on putting the BP Macondo blowout in perspective. So she'll explain the basics of offshore drilling and what may have gone wrong for BP. The event is free and open to the public as well, but you do need to register for that. Uh, registration information, again, is available on our website at academyofsciencestl.org. And then on Tuesday, October 19th at the Missouri History Museum, we feature a panel of local women environmentalists as part of our Perspectives on Science and History series. On Tuesday, October 26th at 7.30 here at the zoo, as Louise said, and as part of our Conservation and Conversations Partnership series, uh, zoo curator of birds Michael Masick speaks on conserving the cool Humboldt penguins. So again, you can find more information on all of these and additional upcoming community science offerings on our website. Uh, and there is some literature on the table outside the auditorium for you to take with you when you leave this evening. With that said, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Melanie Mormile. Dr. Mormile received her PhD from the University of Oklahoma. She is currently Professor of Biological Sciences in the Department of Biological Sciences with a joint faculty appointment in the Department of Geosciences and Geological Engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology, where she is also a senior investigator with the university's Environmental Research Center. Her research focus is environmental microbiology, and her lab has focused on the study of the microbial ecology of environments that are hostile to life, as well as the microbial ecology of swine lagoons. She's here with us tonight to take us on a journey of discovery to Western Australia with a group of geologists and microbiologists to study the area's hypersaline lakes. So Western Australia with its salty and acidic lakes is one of the few places on Earth that is similar to Mars. She's going to tell us what their journey of discovery says about the possibility of life on the red planet. So won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Melanie Mormile. Good evening. Can everybody hear me in the back? Good? All right. Thank you. So, and thank you for the kind invitation to come and speak to you tonight on this, well, frankly, really cool research. It's amazing how many people have gone ahead and offered to be my Sherpa, you know, whenever we do go on these trips. And, um, and one of the questions I'm sure I'll be asked later is, so, we get to go to Australia again? We're hoping. We've got a grant proposal pending right now, so keep your fingers crossed for us. Um, but tonight, what I want to do is go ahead and give you some of the information that we were able to gather back when we went to Australia back in 2005 and all. But before we get to 2005, let me go ahead and give you a little bit of background information. I was having a wonderful conversation with John here earlier about ancient astronomy and, and all, but when we go ahead and start talking about thoughts 
of you know possibility of life on Mars and all. It really began in earnest with the invention of the telescope in, in the late 1870s. Um, Gianova, Gianovi Scapalia, Scapali, um, went ahead and first coined the term <coughs> canali while um, going ahead and observing the images of Mars that he was getting from his telescope. And he actually did a very good job with the telescope he had in hand at going ahead and getting images from the surface of Mars. Now, later on, a little bit later on, Percival Lowell went ahead. He also gazed at Mars through a telescope, but he went ahead and observed more unrealistic canals and all. But the thing was, and what he was able to promote was this whole idea that there's truly this Martian civilization there. And, um, and so people thought that until about, or was hoping for that, up until about the 1960s and 1970s, in which people, NASA and all, started sending probes and the Viking mission and unfortunately, the data that came back indicated that Mars was really just this cold, very dry planet. And as we all know, if you have dry conditions, no water, there's not going to be any life. But the Viking missions did show some preliminary evidence that there was some geological features that suggested flowing water presence, but it wasn't conclusive at all. Um, also, there was evidence found of chloride and sulfate salts. Now, the presence of these sulfate and chloride salts into their evaporative minerals indicative that there was liquid water. Um, along with that, these minerals have been found in Martian meteorites that have actually landed here on Earth. Um, in addition, images from the Mars Global Survey, or back in 2000, went ahead and had clearer images of these geological features. More recently, the Mars rover evidence goes ahead and provides us with evidence that there was previous acidic aqueous environments, and so things like the presence of jarosite um, and the famous blueberries that were popular, you know, in the news, goes ahead and provides evidence that there was liquid water on Mars. Okay, um, more recently, some of the minerals that have been identified on Mars <coughs> include, again, the chloride salts, hydrated manganese, sulfate, and iron oxide. You have clays present, as well as these hydrated iron sulfates, okay, and well, most likely jarosite. So again, you have to have aqueous solutions, and what's even more interesting is that many of these form, especially like the jarosite, under acidic conditions. So some other bits of evidence to go ahead and indicate that Mars once was a wet planet. Um, going ahead and, well, to be honest with you, I never noticed mud cracks and stuff like that. I'm a microbiologist, but I work with geologists. And um, one of the geologists on the team, Dr. Kathy Benson, is a sedimentologist. And so she immediately focused on these mud cracks and all. But if you notice, these mud cracks that we photographed in Australia are very similar to what the rovers have gone ahead and photographed. Other um, bits of evidence include these mud cracked ripple marks. So, and this is just indicative that there was actually water that was influenced by um, wind and all to form those ripple marks. Another bit of evidence is this displaced, displacive sulfate crystals. 
So in Western Australia, you see the formation of these gypsum crystals. And I'll show you some better images in just a little while. But if you notice the size and shapes in all, and these are the images that they've gotten from Mars, highly suggestive that these crystals have formed in place. And then here's a bit of the blueberries in all. And in Western Australia, you do find <coughs> these hematite cricket, or, um, spheres in all. And again, evidence of this iron-rich, oxygenated, shallow water. So, you know, one of the things that we're really um, interested in is going ahead and finding you know, are there environments here on Earth that can serve as these Mars analogs? And so what I've got here are a series of photos. Um, this is actually a salt crystal. This is sodium chloride. And if you notice, there's like these little bulbs and all. I'm not going to talk about that work tonight, but some of the research that we've done is we've actually looked at and studied the microorganisms that become entrapped in those fluid bubbles, so, which is really cool. And so one of the things that people have speculated about is that we might be able, if we get these evaporate rocks from Mars, we might be able to take a look at those fluid inclusions to see if we could find any biosignatures. Okay, these other photos. This is a photo of Lake Aerodrome. And what's interesting about this particular lake is that it precipitates out these huge gypsum crystals. So this here is my friend and colleague, Kathy Dennison, and she's actually the one who has led this research effort. So she's the one that got us started studying these lakes. So, now getting back to the question of you know, are these really good analog systems? Well, when you go ahead and prepare the unusual the mineral and geological or the geochemical assemblage of the different minerals that are present, you've got a match between these Australian lakes and Mars. There's similar sedimentary textures and structures. And then similar diagenic features, those are just the um, sedimentary rocks that are in, in the process of being formed. And so with the observations that have been made on Mars and all, it's highly suggestive that if there was standing water on Mars, it was likely to be saline, very salty, and acidic. And so there's only very few places you know, as Rose mentioned, very few places on Earth to go ahead and find environments like this. So this particular chart here goes ahead and gives you a distribution of the saline lakes across the globe. And most saline lakes are going to be neutral to alkaline. So it's only in Australia that you truly find saline acid lakes. The only other place where you find slightly saline acid lakes is in Chile, South America. So, 2005, it's a sort of tongue in cheek. Um, Kathy came up with this 2005 acid salt lake tour. But what we did was we wanted to go ahead and choose the locations in Australia that would go ahead and provide us with a number of these acidic saline lakes to sample. And so our journey took us to Perth, and we sampled um, Western Australia, and then we went on to Victoria, um, Australia. So what I'll do tonight is actually start my um, tour of Australia for you in Victoria. And the reason for that is that the environment um, there in Victoria is not as extreme as what you find in Western Australia. So um, I wanted to go ahead and show you this image here. This is actually a photo taken from the airplane by my graduate student at the time, Bo Young Hung. 
And she looked down, and you just see this amazing array of these aqueous areas. And what's really interesting, and as you can see, there are different colors and all. So it's suggestive that there's different organisms associated with those lakes. And actually, when you go ahead and you start taking like the pH in all of the lakes, like for example, if you were to go ahead and take samples from two lakes right across the street from each other, they could go ahead and differ from being acidic to alkaline. So one would be alkaline, one would be acidic. So it really depends on the minerals that uh, accumulate in those bodies of water. Okay, so with the Victoria set of samples, okay, what I have here is a blow up of the area of Victoria, and what Kathy did was to go ahead and color code the lakes that we sampled. And so, as you can see, light blue represents slightly alkaline. Um, darker blue, neutral, and then pink to red, moderately to, to extremely acidic. And so as you can see, the <coughs> lake waters themselves were actually pretty much in the neutral zone. It was actually the groundwater around Lake Terrell that is acidic. So to go ahead and take you to some of these lakes, okay, Pink Lakes is associated with the Murray Sunset National Park. And actually, this was the site of an old salt mining operation. And so I don't have the pictures here, but it's sort of like a open air museum. So you can go ahead and take a look at the old machinery. And, and all that they went ahead and used to harvest the salts. But what we were interested in was the actual salts that were precipitating in these lakes and the microorganisms associated with it. So as you can gather from this picture, the lake water is very, very shallow. I mean, you're talking a matter of centimeters for almost all the lakes that we sampled. And then and the shovel here gives you an indication that at the bottom of this lake, there's this crust of salt. Now, if we go ahead and take a closer look at that crust, what's really neat is that you have the salt crystals. Okay, so that's what these squares are. But then you also have a lot of this red material. Well, this red material are halophilic bacteria salt-loving bacteria. And if we were to go ahead and take some of these salt crystals and look at them under the microscope, within the fluid inclusions, they'd be chock full of microorganisms. Okay, another thing of note about these particular salts is that when you go ahead and dig them up, you find that it's a very layered community. And so you have photosynthetic <coughs> microorganisms at the top, a number of different organisms, and you can tell that they're different due to their colors. And at the very bottom of the lake, you would have a layer of this black, smelly material. And that would be anaerobic bacteria that are actually using sulfate to breathe. Okay, and this is just a picture of a test tube showing all the pretty different colors from the bacteria. Okay. Now, the biggest lake that was in, the air, in this area that we sampled is Lake Terrell. And like I said before, the pH was fairly neutral, 6.9. But the groundwater was um, much lower, 5.5. The total dissolved solids was over 150. So, and what that really equates to is if you were to take a percentage of salt and all and add that to a solution, it would be about 15% salt. So not quite saturation, but definitely a lot more concentrated than what you'd find even in seawater. 
be associated with the lake is the Cheatham Salt Works. And this is an active salt facility. And so they go ahead and harvest the salt, allow it to dry, and then go ahead and sell it. But one of the things that we did was we actually took some samples from that salt. And again, my graduate student, Bo Young, went ahead and did a number of enrichments. And we got out three different organisms. You don't need to really know the names of these bacteria, but what is important is that they came out to being pretty closely related to fairly well-known paleophilic or salt-loving bacteria. So there really wasn't any new surprises <coughs> that we encountered in this lake. It was more of, of a reaffirmation um, that there are bacteria growing there and that we can harvest them out. And actually, when you take a look at this plate here, this is just a um, growth plate. And the red dots are the actual colonies of bacteria growing on the media, on the growth media. OK, so let me take you to a more interesting place in Australia. And that's Western Australia, <coughs> noted by the um, circle there. Okay, when we go ahead and consider the geological setting here, it's a very arid climate in all. Um, it's hosted by Archean rocks and shallow sediments. The, the lakes can be fairly small to very large, and like I said before, the depths are very shallow. In fact, one good way of going ahead and describing these lakes are that they're ephemeral. And I'll show you in just a little bit, you know, how evaporation really does impact these lakes. Um, they're influenced by flooding, evaporation, desiccation, and winds. When we go ahead and actually take a look at the map itself, okay, again, we go ahead and take a look at the pHs of the different lakes. And as you can see, most of the lakes in this region are considered to be extremely acidic. So having a pH of 4 or below. OK, so if we go ahead and take a look at the geochemistry, okay, the pH is range from about 1.5 to about 4. Salinities are very high, close to saturation, in fact, um, out the salts precipitating out. Um, temperatures, depending on the season, can range from essentially a refrigerator temperature, 4 degrees Celsius, to a very hot day, 50 degrees Celsius. And the waters themselves, you can find different ions like sodium and chloride, common table salt, as well as manganese, <coughs> calcium, sulfate and a number of different metals like aluminum, iron, silica, um, boron, and um, numerous different heavy metals. In fact, one of the lakes had a very high concentration of nickel, which was interesting. When we go ahead and dig a little bit further down and take a look at the groundwater geochemistry, it's very similar to what we found in the lakes, so similar pHs. Um, similar salinities, maybe a little bit higher. And I wish you guys could see this, but this is a pH probe, and it's reading a pH of 2.6. So, and one thing to keep in mind is that we calibrated the pH meters every morning to make sure that we weren't having any sort of artifacts. And then, um, Going ahead, digging down a little bit further, the deeper groundwaters are very similar to the groundwater close to the surface. Okay, this is getting back to how ephemeral these um, lakes are. So two different lakes, Cumulative Raceway Lake and Dead Kangaroo Lake. Um, as I was mentioning to somebody earlier, since these lakes are ephemeral, one of the fun things we were able to do was go ahead and provide names for most of all of the lakes. And so you can uh, figure out why we call that lake that lake or that Kangaroo Lake. But to, to really 
um, note here, okay, if we go ahead and take a look at what this lake looked like back in January 2006, there was standing water. However, five years before, <coughs> the area was pretty dry. So you had essentially a salt flat forming. Um, with Dead Kangaroo Lake, when we were there, the group, um, in the Austrial winter, there was plenty of water there. In fact, when we were there, it was actually under a flooding condition. So they had record rainwater or rain precipitation at the time. But when Kathy and my other colleagues went there a year later, it was completely dry. So very ephemeral. Okay, so once we were out at the site, okay, we went ahead and got into the water, take samples, and all again. This is Kathy. Um, this is Stacy Story, who was a graduate student of one of my other colleagues, Dr. Ovo Ekwanobi. And this is Elliot um, Janecki, who was actually an undergraduate student of Kathy's. So, um, <coughs> Elliot sort of got the job of digging all the holes for the groundwater analysis, but um, he, he, was a, he was quite the trooper, but he would go ahead, dig the holes for groundwater sampling, and then take the measurements. Um, also, while we were out in the field, we would note any weird things, like going ahead and noting if there was bubbling, bubbles coming up from the surface. When we saw bubbles, and when I go ahead and show you some of our microbial suspects, the bubbles indicate that there's microbial metabolism going on, and that you have these gases being formed as products. Okay, other things that we noted was the actual mineral formation. So, at the one lake that I showed you before, like Aerodrome, what we found was that you had the formation of these just beautiful gypsum crystals. And they're about that large. So, so lots of interesting crystals there. And then in other lights, you would find a nice layer of halite, sodium chloride. And so this is just more of a close-up showing you some of the um, cubic type of formation. So, and then this slide is to show some of the early diagenic features that we found in these lakes. So, with this, this is just showing you some more of that halite, and then the halite actually being interspersed in the sediments themselves. Um, this is that photo of the small gypsum crystals. This photo goes ahead and shows you areas where you have hematite, going ahead and forming, so that's that iron mineral, and then jarosite. So in jarosite is that mineral that has been found, evidence for that has been found on Mars, and you only find jarosite formation under saline acid conditions. And then this um, photo just shows the hematite um, crications in, in sort of or um, being of semblance to the Mars blueberries. Okay, so now what else, what does this really have to do with trying to determine if there truly is life on Mars? Well, the big thing is, is that the evidence from Mars is going ahead and showing that there probably was standing water present. And so if you have the water present, and so far, all the environments that have been explored on Earth in which you have liquid water, you have life present. And so by going ahead and focusing on, in this particular case, our modern acid saline environments, we can go ahead and get some clues as to what sort of life we could expect on Mars if it's present. So, we go ahead and first go to Australia and take some field observations. So, well, we go ahead and see the trees and stuff like that, but we know that there's no trees on Mars. So we have to go ahead and look a little bit further. 
Um, other signs of life around these lakes. Okay, we were able to find these sand spiders and all. They were really neat to look at. And we also went ahead and noted any animal tracks. And so these are kangaroo tracks and all. But I'm a microbiologist. So I am interested in these microbial organisms, and I'm prim primarily interested in these extremophilic microorganisms. And so as Rose was saying in her introduction for me, you know, I do go ahead and study microorganisms that love conditions that are actually hostile to us. And so some of the different classes of extremophiles, you can have extremophiles based on temperature. So you can have organisms that love super hot environments. So like for example, if you go to Yellowstone, and the hot springs there. You go ahead and you find these wonderful, beautiful streamers of microorganisms. On the other hand, you can also have psychrophils. These are organisms that love cold conditions. And so you can go down to like Antarctica and find organisms that are psychrophiles. And actually, if you go ahead and take those samples and just bring them up to room temperature, that temperature change is enough to kill them off. So they're actually killed under conditions that we thrive under. Now the things that I'm interested in are the extremes in pH. So some of my other research <coughs> is focused on these alkalophiles. And these are organisms that prefer very high pHs. So some of the other organisms that we work with in my lab prefer growing at pHs of 10, of 11 in all. Um, with the Australian work and some of my other work, we're also interested in these acidophiles. So these are organisms that prefer to grow at pHs of 4 or below. In addition to these extremes in pH, you also have the salt-loving microorganisms. And so with the halophiles, these organisms have an absolute requirement for salt to grow. If they don't have salt in their um, growth media, they won't grow. And in fact, some of them will actually pop and burst. So these are the, the halophiles and the acidophiles are the two types of organisms that we were interested in looking for. Now to give you a little bit of a better perspective about this pH range, okay, this gives you an idea of the the um, pH strips that we all used back in grade school. So going from very acidic to very alkaline, these are some common um, products. But the lakes that we are particularly interested in tend to fall between a pH of four and three. So that range would be similar to the pH that we would find in old fashioned tomatoes and vinegar and soda and beer. So not too extreme, but you don't typically find too many things growing in those products. Okay, so out in the field, first thing we did was to go ahead and look for microbial suspects. One of the things that um, we had to address when we went ahead and did this research, well, as a microbiologist, it's sort of ingrained in us that if we have liquid water, there's going to be life. However, many geologists did not believe that there could be life under these you know, condition, extreme conditions of both very salty and very acid. So one of the things we had to do was go ahead and conclusively show that there truly was life in these environments. So just by walking around, the lakes themselves who found evidence of life. And so like I was telling you before about these bubbles, okay, that's indicative of microbial metabolism and all. You can have algal slimes. Um, you can have these filamentous structures and <coughs> all of that can combine to go ahead and form foam. So if you have foam materials and all, chances are there is some sort of living cells that went ahead and produced it. Okay, so this is just a summation 
of some of the field evidence that we accumulated to go ahead and show that there was life around these lakes. And that includes you know, some of the big life, like eucalyptus trees, kangaroo tracks, the spiders and all. But going ahead and specifically looking at the um, microbiology evidence, okay, when you have this black sulfur smelling mud, okay, again, that's indicative of those anaerobic microorganisms that are actually using sulfate to breathe. And so what they do is they take the sulfate and then they form hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten gas, or the rotten egg gas. Um, we found foam and bubbles, different sorts of um, algal evidence, gray slime. Um, interesting, and this is something that you guys can go ahead and do too. If you go to like a stream and all, and you find this oily sheen present, if you go ahead, because most of us, when we see that oily sheen, we think that, oh, somebody spilled some oil, or there's a hydrocarbon pollution event. It's not necessarily so. If you go ahead and take a stick and sort of jab into that oily sheen and it breaks, that goes ahead and tells you that there is manganese oxidizing bacteria present. So it was bacteria that actually formed that oily sheen look, but it was actually the oxidation of manganese. Um, other things that we looked for, sulfur smell, again, hydrogen sulfide and all, and then going ahead and actually seeing po possible organisms within those fluid inclusions. So, so one of the lakes that we focused on was Lake Brown. So, and this truly was a main lake. So, um, but the pH of the lake at the time of sampling was 4.5. So into that acidic range, when the pH of the groundwater was taken, it was a pH of 3 or 3.7. And then the salt concentration was about 15%. So salty and acidic. And actually, this is a photo of Bo Young, who was my graduate student. Okay, so what Bo did when she got back to the lab with those samples was to go ahead and set up enrichment cultures. So when you go ahead and set up enrichment cultures, you want to mimic the environment where you took your samples as best as you could or can. And so what she did was she went ahead and made up this media and then tried to match the salts as best as she could. And so what you see here is this is our negative control. And then as you can see, that's a clear fluid. So there's no growth occurring. However, she did have a number of positive cultures. And then when she photographed the very bottom of these tubes, you can see that there's an accumulation of this pigmented, um, pigmented microorganisms. Now when she actually went ahead and isolated some of these bacteria, um, one of them that we designated Lake Brown or Brown One actually grows up and it forms these pretty yellow colonies on plates. When you go ahead and take a look at these things under the microscope, they're sort of like rod shaped, but what's really weird is they have that round center part. So we're still trying to figure out what's going on there. Now, when we go ahead and take a look at the tolerances for this organism, okay, this graph right here shows you under what salt conditions it can grow under. So it definitely prefers a um, concentration of salt of about 5%. And it will go ahead and grow up to saturation. It does not do so well when you don't provide salt in the media. So it's definitely a halophilic organism. When we went ahead and took a look at the pH range, its preferred pH is a pH of four. So it can do fairly well under a pH of five and six, and not so well at a pH of seven, and does not grow at all at a pH of eight. 
And then we'll go ahead and take a look at the temperature optimum. The temperature optimum is actually about body temperature, about 37 to 40 degrees Celsius. And what was really reassuring about this research is that these conditions match the conditions that we found at Lake Brown at the time of sampling. Okay, now this is probably is very hard for you to see, um, but this is a phylogenetic tree. And one way that you can think of a phylogenetic tree is sort of like it's the family tree of these microorganisms. So what we want to try and do with this sort of analysis is to try and figure out which organisms are the most closely related to our isolate. And so here's our isolate here. And as you can actually hopefully can see, you can see that there's something written here. These are the other organisms that it's most closely related to. When we go ahead and take a comparison of this particular gene that's used a lot in taxonomy, you find that it has a 95% match with this other organism. And so what that tells you, well, if this match was a 97% match or above, that would have told us that it was the same species. So it's lower than 97%. So we know it's at least a new species. Um, the cutoff for a new genus typically tends to be about 93%. So just looking at the phylogenetic tree, in all, goes ahead and tells us, well, it's probably a new species. But when we went ahead and did a comparison with its closest relative, we actually found that there's a lot of differences. And so if we go ahead and just basic stuff, like the cell shape, okay, this particular <coughs> organism is a rock, and you saw the picture of that. Well, its closest relative actually is a round shape. So very different. The colony color also differs. But then when we go ahead and actually take a look at some of its metabolism and all, there's also large differences. So catalase is the enzyme that goes ahead and sort of helps with the um, oxygen byproducts. When, when we respire, okay, when people talk about free radicals and stuff like that, free radicals are produced while we respire. So we've got enzymes, we've got catalase in us to deal with those free radicals. Most aerobic organisms do too, but our isolate doesn't. Um, cytochrome oxidase, that just refers to the um, enzyme that actually goes ahead and transfers electrons to oxygen which is why we can breathe oxygen. We're dumping electrons on the oxygen forming water. Well, our organism doesn't have it. So it's using something else to essentially utilize oxygen, which we need to figure out what it's doing. So, so we were interested in going ahead and getting pure cultures and all, but one of the really annoying things about trying to do environmental microbiology is when you go ahead and sample and try and get bacteria out, at the best, at the best, you can only culture about 1% of the microorganisms present in an environment. And so we're able to go ahead and take DNA from these environments and go ahead and take the DNA, isolate, isolate it, and then go ahead and amplify it, make many more copies of it. And so this technique here that I'm showing you is denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis. Okay, big long name, we just call it DGGE. Um, what you need to get out of this particular image is that each one of these columns represents a different lake that we went ahead and sampled, that we got the DNA from. Each one of these lines represents a unique species. So what you can do is then go ahead and compare 
each of the lanes, and <coughs> what we found is that none of the lanes matched each other. So each one of these lakes had different, a different microbial community. Um, also, what I tried to do, or what Bo did, was to go ahead and arrange these from the most acidic lakes to the most alkaline lakes. So, and again, that didn't really seem to go ahead and give us any indication as to patterns and stuff like that. The takeaway message is that each one of these lakes had its own unique microbial community. Um, another thing, if you hadn't already noticed, is some of these lakes are color-coded. And so what we wanted to do was, again, go ahead, take that DNA, and see if we could find the closest relatives to the organisms, and then use that data to go ahead and compare the different communities in these lakes. So we focused on four lakes. Twin Lake East, so which was the most acidic and also the saltiest of the four lakes that we focused on. Um, Dead Kangaroo Lake was also acidic, pH of 4.3, but not as saline or salty as Twin Lake East. King Lake was more of a moderate lake, so it had a neutral pH. It was still very salty, though. It was a very salty lake. And then Pink Lake is actually representative more of an evaporative type of lake. So this Pink Lake was located near the, um, actually near the coast of um, Western Australia, so very marine influenced. So, okay, so I know again this is really complicated. Actually, is there anything you can turn the front lights down a little bit? Okay, um, the reason why I color coded those lakes is that what I wanted you to be able to see is that those colors actually grouped for the most part. And so the organisms that we found, like the Twin Lake East, all grouped together. The organisms from King Lake also tended to group together. Dead kangaroo was sort of sprinkled throughout. And then the more like normal saline lake that we studied, Pink Lake, which we would go ahead and think that we would have the most diversity, was pretty much scattered throughout that whole phylogenetic tree. So, that <coughs> indicated to us with a number of things. One, again, confirming that these lakes had their own unique microbial communities. For the lakes that were more extreme, like for example, Twin Lake East, very acid, very salty, okay, it tended to go ahead and the organisms tended to be much more specialized in all. Um, when we go ahead and consider, thank you, um, pink, pink Lake, okay, that was more of a normal saline lake, and so we'd expect more diversity present. So, right there, 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 Pink Lake. So, so that was pretty important. <coughs> okay, so um, now, getting back a little bit to the whole idea of comparing these lakes to Mars and, and why it's important. Well, actually, one of the cool things that happened, and it was great timing for this talk, but last week in science, they went ahead and made this news focus, growing prospects for life on Mars, okay, and this is dividing the astrobiologists. So the astrobiology community right now is trying to figure out the best locations on Mars to sample. But, you know, one of the things I really wanted to emphasize is that as we get more and more data from Mars, it's becoming more and more evident that life could have occurred on this planet. And so if I go ahead and present you with some of the recent discoveries that were emphasized in that article, well, 
One thing that's recently come out is that there's widespread ice underneath the surface soils. And in fact, um, I'm blanking on the rover name right now, but one of the rovers, one of its wheels was actually broken. And so they literally had to, when they moved the rover, had to drag that one wheel. And when they did, they went ahead and noticed this white spot. And then over time, the white spot disappeared, indicative that you had sublimation occurring of the possible ice that was present there. Um, other things that have been found recently is the presence of carbonate. So again, this is a mineral that is only formed under liquid water conditions. There's a number of things that have come out regarding the perchlorate salts. Um, one thing is that when you go ahead and consider the temperatures on Mars, you do not expect to find liquid water. The temperatures are just too cold. However, when you go ahead and have a salt such as perchlorate, you can actually go ahead and drop the temperature in which you can have liquid water. So, theoretically, with the presence of this perchlorate salt, you can have brines present. So, and again, if there's liquid water, possibility of life. Um, another interesting thing about perchlorate, okay, as I was mentioning before, you know, we use oxygen to breathe. And I was mentioning the sulfate-reducing bacteria. Sulfate-reducing bacteria use sulfate to breathe. Well, there's actually microorganisms that use perchlorate to breathe. So they can go ahead and use this perchlorate as an energy source. And another thing about the perchlorate is experiments that have been done um, with um, Chilean soils, okay, the driest environment here on Earth. When they go ahead and take those soil samples and expose it to perchlorate, and then oxidize it, well, they get out the same results as the Viking experiment did. Essentially, what came out instead of organic signals, they got carbon dioxide and these chlorinated methanes and all. Well, when you go ahead and do similar experiments here on Earth and have chlor or perchlorate present, you don't get organics, you get carbon dioxide and coordinated methanes. So this is suggestive that maybe there was false negatives that occurred with the Viking data or Viking analysis. And then um, as an anaerobic microbiologist, I'm particularly interested in this discovery of methane. Um, what people are finding is that methane is outgassing <coughs> on Mars. When methane goes ahead and hits the highly oxidative environment there on the surface, it's going to go ahead and be converted to carbon dioxide. So you would not expect methane to stick around. So since methane doesn't stick around, this is indicative that methane is being formed either through ge geological processes or through methanogenesis or bacteria that are producing methane. Um, another thing about this is people are able to take a look at the isotopic ratio <coughs> of the methane. And so when you have well, the isotopes of carbon, which is what they're looking at, you can have carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. Um, life will preferentially choose carbon-14. And so um, one of the things that's really going to be interesting when they go ahead and um, send the next Mars probe up is that they're going to go ahead and be specifically looking for these isotopic ratios to go ahead and see if that can be indicative that this methane is either being produced geologically or through um, biological means. So, let's come back to Earth now. 
And so overall, um, some of the conclusions that I would like you to take away from this presentation is that one, we found distinct microbial diversity in all the lakes that we sampled. Um, when you go ahead and consider the different types of micro or, or things that you can possibly look for, extremophiles are the type of organ or the type of things, signatures that you should be looking for, and especially the salt loving, acid loving bacteria, because they're found in lakes that are similar to what might have been present on Mars. And thus, they provide a good target for the search for possible life on Mars. So, and then this is just a quote that I have up on my door at work. Science may carry us to Mars, but it will leave, Earth, leave the Earth people as ever by the in that. So, um, we have a number of people and institutions to thank. The um, research support came from the Biogeological Sciences Program of the National Science Foundation, and they have just been great. Um, the co-PIs on the project, as I've mentioned before, um, Kathy Benison is at Central Michigan University. Um, Dr. Franca Obo Ekwadogi is one of my colleagues there in Missouri Science and Technology. We were very fortunate to have a very capable postdoc on the project, and she was Dr. Brenda Bowen. So she was working with Kathy, and now she is an assistant professor at Purdue University. And actually, Stacy was a graduate student working with Franca, but now Stacy is pursuing her PhD with Brenda. Um, Bo went ahead, successfully completed her master's with me, and is now pursuing her PhD at Binghamton University. And then the undergraduate student who um, did research with us, Elliot Janecki, worked with Kathy, and he also is pursuing a PhD at Binghamton University. So, and with that, thank you for your attention. And I've got a couple of quick, fun Australia slides, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So. Salt samples actually from the Bad 
water salt um, plains in California. And the salt samples that we've studied were dated to 97,000 years old, and we were able to get viable bacteria out. So we had a very good conversation about you know, going ahead and controlling for contamination, stuff like that, very critical. So the, so the Mars rovers were able to do a lot of geological studies right. uh, with the equipment that was on. Were they able to, were they able to test for life? If so? No, no. And that's one of the biggest arguments in the astro com astrobiology community right now. Because the um, instruments that NASA has gone ahead and selected for these missions have been they're not looking for direct evidence of life. Um, the past evidence or the past data and all has, like you said, been all geochemical. Um, with the rover that they're planning on setting up the fall of next year, they are going to be specifically looking at the isotopic ratios. And again, if you've got microorganisms present, they're going to be selecting the lower radioisotopes, and they're also going to be looking to see if there's amino acids present. And one of the neat things about amino acids is that they're handed. So you can have a right-handed version or a left-handed version, and life only prefers, I think, the left-handed version. So if you find a predominant amount of the one, you have to find amino acids in the first place. And then if amino acids are present, if they're all in one form or the other and not an equal mixture, then that's going to be indicative that some life went ahead and, um, and produced that. Yes? As a result of your work, have you identified uh, new indications of life that you can control? Not really. I mean, it's the type of thing that one of the things that people do discuss is if you do go ahead and get samples, should we go ahead and try and extract for DNA and all? That probably isn't the best idea because um, I'm going ahead and talking with people like Dr. Ken Nielsen, who had been at the Jet Propulsion Lab for a while. He's now at the University of Southern California and the um, Venture Institute. But, you know, what we want to be prepared for is um, signatures of life that aren't necessarily going to be identical to the life that we find here on Earth. So with my work, you know, it's going ahead and trying to figure out, well, if there are microorganisms present, what type of microorganisms would be present? But we could be completely off base. You know, again, that 
long, I do apologize for that large, ugly phylogenetic tree. But when we did go ahead and do the comparison between the DNA that we got out with the known microorganisms, they may hit um, other calophilic organisms and and then other things like we got one that actually hit very close to an organism that was radiation tolerant. So, which actually makes sense, going back to your question about the desiccation, radiation tolerance actually is a result of being able to withstand desiccation. Because when a microorganism goes ahead and undergoes desiccation, we have the shearing or the breaking up of the DNA and that's what you get with radiation, too. So that was sort of nice to go ahead and see that correlation. Yeah, unfortunately, well, not really unfortunately, but um, with these particular lakes, they were all aerobic because they were so shallow. So um, it would be actually my colleagues to go back to Australia and did some coring. And it would be really neat to see if there's anaerobic microorganisms there, and, and I think that you do make a good, you know, correlate, possible correlation. Yes? Question about Australia. Do right. people live around those lakes? There are like roads around there, I don't know pictures. And do, you, do they use this water in, in purposes like maybe traditional medicine or something? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. Well, we did go ahead and, well, we didn't actually see any Aborigines, except in Victoria, um, one of the main cities. But the people that we did go ahead and encounter were those people that were actually trying to, well, grow the sheep and everything. Unfortunately, one of the things that they have a large problem with in Western Australia is that you don't have fresh water present. And so they actually have to go ahead and pump in water from the coast. And um, one of the things that we saw signs up about is that they were really concerned about the acid acidification of their waters. So over time, these waters have become more acid and more unusable. So, but I really don't know about, you know, what the evolution is going to be. What surprised me on, the, on your slides is that uh -huh. when you are sampling the water, you actually, their food walk into the water, which is pretty much pH uh, unusable, you wouldn't put your hands Actually, I was sort of surprised that that question hasn't come up earlier, because one of the questions I do get is, what does it feel like? You know, because you've got these really salty acid, you know, waters around. And we did. We just wore, you know, water shoes and all. We only had one pair of boots amongst all of us. Um, but the worst of the lakes were just, you felt a little tingling. So, and your skin did become a little bit dry, but it really wasn't too bad. And that's why I wanted to show that one image of the pH scale. So, so it, you know, if you walked through like Coca-Cola, it would probably feel about the same way. Yes? So what sort of pH and salt range is compatible with multicellular life, like plants or animals? Good oh, question. Um, when you go ahead and <coughs> Well, like one of the questions that I was asked earlier before the talk, you know, what sort of aquatic life did we see? The um, lakes and all that we that we actually saw any sort of macro life was gastropod lake, and I think that that had a pH of about five, and essentially it was snails. So that's why we named it gastropod lake. Um, 
that typically when you go ahead and have you know, a lake that you want to fish in or whatever, your pH should be in about the range of seven to eight or so. Um, some of the, one of the other lakes that I also studied, so Lake up in Washington State, it's very saline and it's got a pH of about 10.5. Well, there's no fish in there, but it's part of a series of lakes. And so the next lake over is more dilute and it also has a lower pH and they can actually stop fishing it. Now that doesn't mean that the fish are reproducing, but they can stop fishing it. So it really is um, a fairly narrow range that you know multicellular cellular life can be stamped. Okay, there's two more. One in the back and then you. Okay. 